Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Hello, it's David Horsager with the Trusted Leader Show. I'm on with the most creative guy you'll ever meet in the world. He has created for the most uh, highest revenue producing restaurants in America. He is the creator of the Rainforest Cafe, T-Rex, Yed- Yak and Yeti, the Boathouse. You've been some of these places. We've been some of these places. We've celebrated birthdays at these places. We've uh, dated at these. I've taken g- girls on dates at these places. And uh, we had an amazing time, thanks to you, down there not too long ago, celebrating I was speaking it in Disney, and uh, you set us up at a great table uh, with our whole family and celebrating a volcano cake with my son at at the uh, that was at the T Rex. But you're sitting at the boathouse today. His he's the CEO and founder of Schuster Creative, and his name is Steve Schuster. Thanks for being on, and thanks for being my friend. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be your friend. It's a real easy thing to do. Well, Steve and I uh, got to be on a part of a leadership group for the last several years together and kind of a roundtable leadership group. And anytime I get to sit next to, to Steve, I'm better for it for sure. So anyway, let's get into this, Steve. Just tell us a little bit. I, mean, I want to go into your process of creativity and some of the things you you do things. We were talking about it earlier, unlike anybody else in the world. But um Tell, tell us a little bit, a couple things people don't know about you. A little background. I know your wife is amazing, too. Give us a little ba- uh, a, a couple things we don't know. Uh, a couple of things you don't know. I'm uh, uh, very physically active. I'm an avid tennis player, um, horseback rider, skier, uh, uh, any kind of water sports. Um, uh, I love to be active. And I'm an avid collector, and most people that collect things collect more than one thing. So I collect antique jukeboxes. Um, I collect uh, antique cars. I collect antique motorcycles. Um, (coughs) Excuse me. And most of these things are used as props for what I create in the restaurant business. Our restaurants, I call them attractions, restaurants, and retail stores. So we just don't have restaurants. Uh, We start off with attractions because all of our restaurants have two, three hour waiting lines. So I like to call them an attraction. And at the boathouse down here at Disney Springs, we have Amphicars, which were made from 1962 to 1967. And they actually go physically from land and into the water. So that's an attraction. Uh, And it's next to the restaurant and it causes a a great deal of appeal nationwide. Um, so we're different in a lot of senses. Yeah, yeah, and you're different, uh, people would say, in a really mighty good way, but you certainly were willing to take some risks, risks and everything else. If you haven't read it, his best-selling book is It's a Jungle in There. Inspiring That's right. Lessons, Hard-Won Insights, and Other Acts of Entrepreneurial Daring. Let's talk about that because you were daring and I've read it. And, you know, one of the big, big breakthroughs was Rainforest Cafe. Uh, it, the, one of the big ones is at the Mall of America. There's always a wait. We've been there multiple times. But tell us, tell us about that journey a little bit. Let's take that Rain Care, Rainforest Cafe. It's a, a fun, inspiring story. Well, I, I decided that it would be fun. I've had tropical birds my whole life. Um, macaws, some of the largest birds that there are. And they're all hand-raised, domestically red, uh, bred babies that I actually hand-fed and, and raised. So people don't know that about me. Um, and I learned a lot from the tropical birds I had as pets. I learned about deforestation. I learned about the, the plight of the tropical birds uh, poaching. Uh, you name it, I've learned about it and studied it. And that gave me the inspiration to create the Rainforest Cafe because I would come home from work every day in radio and television broadcasting, which was my background. And I would say, um, I I talk to the birds, Uh, you know, I'd have my Gucci bag and my Gucci shoes, but I'd walk in there and I'd let the birds out and we'd have these conversations. And I would say to myself, the world should see the beautiful plumage and, 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 and the feathers and the colors of these 
magnificent animals on top of the fact that they'll outlive us. You know, they'll live 80 years to, uh, to 120 years. Uh, so normally people that have uh, tropical birds will will them. And I pay a young lady uh, to come in three hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year to spend three hours with the birds. She takes them out of their cages. She talks to them. She plays with them. We get them fresh fruit, fresh water, fresh vegetables, clean their cages. They have their own air conditioning system, their own heating system, their own their own dishwasher. Um, I mean, we, we've we gone really far out. And, and I love them. And they're the reasons I created the Rainforest Cafe. And I promised them when we make it with the Rainforest Cafe that I'd never get rid of them. That they'd be my 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 compadres for the rest of my life, and that's exactly what they are now. Well, that rainforest cafe—that was a time you weren't maybe as when you were taking the risk, and now that's become a, a monumental success. But you weren't as successful as you are today. You had to take a big risk. You took a house in uh, d- down there in the south side of the cities. T- tell people the risk you took and what you did to get that that sold. Well. Uh, uh, I had just come out of a a place called Jukebox Saturday Night, which I created in Minneapolis. And, um, uh, you know, when you close a place, people want to know why uh, investors get nervous about investing in a new place. So I decided that I would immerse myself in the rainforest and I actually built a tropical rainforest in my home. Uh, It it took me a year um, and I had uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the foliage. I had uh, 37 tropical birds. I had 3,700 bright orange extension cords running through my home um, with three gasoline generators in the backyard. Uh, The DEA rated me. They said I had the highest residential electric bill in the state of Minnesota. So they thought I was uh, uh, growing marijuana plants. And at three (laughs) o'clock in the morning, they rated me. I was in my underwear and they wanted to frisk me. And I said, what? I said, there's nothing to frisk. I'm in my underwear. Anyway, at the bottom line is they searched the entire house and they all came out with wet spots in their private areas. They were peeing in their pants from laughing because they thought they 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 they, they found a, a drug deal or somebody growing marijuana plants and said they they said they found a nut and they all became investors. Um, they all made out really well. And I don't know if you know this, but we opened up 45 rainforest cafes in seven years in three continents. I basically lived out of a suitcase. And it's been one of the most incredible experiences to teach others how not to give up. And when you believe in something, how important it is just to go for it. You had people calling you calling you crazy, you know. T- My tell, ship tell, and, tell, and hired a uh, a, a, a a psychiatrist, and and the guy would call me every week, and he'd say, "Listen, your appointment's already paid for. Your your neighbors all chipped in. They really think that you're nuts. They heard that you were painting your ceilings and walls uh, black in preparation for your greenery treatment because you wanted to create a canopy for a tropical rainforest. The neighbors thought that I was into black magic, and I was going to eat their kids." <laughs> you maybe just should have said, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. So, so tell us about that journey. So, actually, what I'd like to jump into with our short time together is that process of creativity because you kind of use the same process all the time. You're building all these. I mean, now you've had so many wins at Disney, they'll take your call, but it wasn't that way at first. What's, what's the process? Well, the, the process is I have to like what I'm doing. That, 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 I know that sounds, uh, you know, uh, trite, but at the end of the day, if I don't like what I'm creating, I can't create it because I put 100% of me into it. I don't sleep real well at night. I think about all the elements. Uh, Attention to detail is what we're known for. Uh, Disney has said it quite often that we've out Disney Disney. That's the best compliment that you you can ever imagine. Um, People say don't sweat the small stuff, David. And I say just the opposite. You need to sweat the small stuff because that's what makes the big stuff work. And again, I only create, you know, a lot of people come to us and say, will you create this for us? Will you create that for us? It's hard when I'm creating things for myself and for my partners. So uh, I create things based on what I like. 
with the Rainforest Cafe, I had tropical birds. It was really easy for me to study and go to libraries for years and learn about deforestation and how it affects the rest of the world, um, the oxygen levels, all, all the things that go along with it. So I study. I spent a lot of times reading books. I, I spent a lot of time uh, doing research and development with other concepts and other people. I travel a lot. I look at things a lot. And I determine what I feel I can attribute to and what that concept might be and where it would fit in. And then I have to look for landlords, places to put it. Then I have to look for financing and find the people that are willing to put the money in. So it's, it's a very, very, very long process. Each concept I create takes about five years before it's open from the day, the inception, uh, from the day of inception. So it's a long, tedious process. And um, as I wrote in my book, it's a jungle in there. No is yes waiting to happen. And that's an important thing to to realize that it will happen if you don't give up. Tell us about that. Most people give up or, you know, don't persevere through some of the battles you've had. Tell us about that experience and how do you keep going? Well, it, you got to talk to yourself. You know, there's been many nights where, where I'd look in the mirror and ask if I was crazy and the mirror would say, no, you're psychotic. And then I'd laugh and I'd wake up the next day and I'd get back on the bike. So if you fall off your bicycle, you, you got to stop pedaling, get your stuff together and get back on and keep going. And, and I've done many of that. I, I can't tell you there have been many days that uh, I question my own sanity. And then I laugh at myself and, and just keep going, keep going. And people ask me all the time, uh, you know, what do you do? And I, I said, the answer is never, ever, ever, ever under any circumstances give up. On the other hand, you got to know when to give up and change your direction. Um, and I tell people all the time that giving up is not an option. Um, but you have to be smart. Um, change is inevitable. Change is going to happen whether you and I want it to happen or not. How how do you do, how do you decide? Because I talk about this. The, some of the things I've been writing on the last few years have been about uh, tensions that we face. So so like we've got. Um, I believe, you know, you got consultants that say it's always like this or it's always like that. And what do we know? We have to think that you got someone, you could say someone, oh, the early bird gets the worm, but be patient. Both can be true. We got, you know, persevere or pivot. We got, should we diversify on this? That would be good. Go for everybody. Or should we be homogenous and stay focused on that one? But on that persevere or pivot, how did you know when to pivot? Because you see pers people persevere right off the cliff. You see people pivot too early because they give up. What do you do? It's gut. You got to listen to your gut. You know, it, the gut is one of the most important things you could have because it's attached to your brain. And uh, when, when, when you smell smoke, you, you know, there's fire close by uh, and you got to take all of those, those uh, uh, key elements that make you question what is going on here. Is this right? Is this not right? And your life experiences. I got to tell you, being part of the Harvey McKay Roundtables really helped me a lot to get everybody else's professional perspectives and feelings. But at the end of the day, it's all up to you. You're going to be the failure or you're going to be the success. And it's who you align yourselves with. I talk about this all the time. I hire people that are better than I. And people are afraid to do that. A lot of people say, hey, I'm afraid of the competition. They're coming in. They're opening up across the street. So what? All it does is bring more people to the excitement of the entertainment area that you're you're creating it, and um, and I spend a lot of money on on props and learning um, uh, because I like to use things other people don't. I I want to be an icon wherever we open. I want to be an icon, and 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 I want to be the, the main guy on the block. And in order to do that, you really have to know your stuff and you have to study and you have to be willing to change. You created some of the most re amazing restaurants in the world, certainly experiences in the world. Then the pandemic hit. Yes. What what what'd you learn? Well, I learned that you can do a lot with a lot less. Uh, that That's, I think, the, the number one thing that we've learned uh, is you can still continue to be successful and, and wildly successful with less people. Uh, and we learned to take care of our, our, our team and our staff. We actually made meals 
for everybody that works for us and the people that they had at home waiting for them, their mom, their dad, their cousin, their brother. So we, we allowed everybody to take food home and we provided uh, an experience for them even during a really bad time. And what that did, it solidified their relationship with us. And when the pandemic was over or things eased up and we were able to go back to business, nobody wanted to leave us because we took care of them. We, we, hmm. we became class X. When everybody else laid people off, we found ways to use them. We found ways to do maintenance and other things that we couldn't do while we were doing a thousand or fifteen hundred people a day, um, and, and and that worked out really well for us. We understand the frustration of overspending on training programs without seeing long-term culture change and measurable results. From decades of working with top brands and organizations, we have seen that building a high-performing, high-trust culture is the only way to create a lasting impact. High trust leaders make the difference between a flavor of the month training initiative and measurable learning and development. Our community of TrustEd certified partners is equipped with a suite of tools to build a high performing, high trust culture where people can perform at their best. So if you want to start solving the root issue in your organization and produce lasting results, head to TrustEdgePlatform.com to learn more. And now back to the show. You've got this creative streak. You've also got this restorative streak. You you restored one, this amazing barn where you live in the on the on the Minnesota property. Tell me about that. That's one I still, by the way, haven't seen. And we've talked about it a lot because we have a, a farm and we want to restore an old barn. But um, what? Tell me, you know, tell us about it. Well, I, I was looking for a place for storage for our antique motorcycles, our props, our, our antique jukeboxes, our cars. And, and I read an ad in the paper about uh, uh, Eden Prairie looking for someone to, to uh, buy this property to use for storage only. And they made me sign all kinds of conditions when I, when I bought it. Anyway, it's an interesting story. It, it was up for, for an auction. And I think the price was $83,500. And it was a sealed auction. So you had to put the auction amount in that you were willing to bid. And minimum bid was $83,500. I called my attorney. He said, have you seen the place yet? I said, no. He said, well, maybe you'd go look at it before you bid on it. So I went and I looked at it. And I heard that there was over 500 people that have already looked at it. And there was a lot of interest in it. And I called my attorney. I said, I'm putting a bid in. And he said, are you sure? And I said, yes. And he said, how much are you putting the bid in for? And I said, well, minimum bid's 87. I said, let's put in a bid for 92. And I called him back a half hour later. And I said, you know what? I want to change that. He said, are you crazy? What are you going to change it to? I said, to 100. And then I called back the next day. And I said, I'm going to change it to 110. And he said, what are you doing? Are you nuts? And I said, listen, I don't want to miss out on it. It's a closed bid auction. And and from what I understand is, you know, hundreds of people walking through this place with interest. And um, at the end of the day, I forgot about it. And 60 days later, I get a call at 11 o'clock at night from the, the newspaper, the Star Tribune. And they said to me, congratulations, Mr. Schussler. And I said, for what? And they said, you were the winner of this barn in Eden Prairie, Minnesota. And I said, oh, my God, that's fantastic. And and I'm licking my chops and, and I'm feeling real good about it because I, I had forgotten it was two, two months earlier. And they said to me, can we tell you one more thing? And I said, sure. And the young lady said to me, you were the only bidder. <laughs> so I bid against myself three times, but I won. And, there you go. And, and it took us a year and a half to two years to restore it. Almost eight months just for the roof of this place. But. I love taking things that are old and turning them into using what the charm that that kept it old and turning it into something cool. And we do over 110 weddings every single year. So there are people that uh, uh, will never forget uh, their experiences at, at, at this barn. We call it Green Acres Event Center. Um, Green Acres is a place for me. You remember the song. Oh, and, yes. And, and, and it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I put artificial cows. Well, not artificial, but they're, they're fiberglass cows that I bought in Panama. And I had them delivered to Eden Prairie. And I put them all over the place. And people would call me every single day, David. And they would say, thank you. 
Thank you for making us laugh on the way to work every day. Thanks for taking this barn that, that is a staple in, in Minnesota and saving it. And uh, it feels good. Besides the fact that it's successful uh, financially and, and it cost a small fortune to, to save it. And we got parking from the city and we had to pay for that and all kinds of things that we had to do to make it uh, a, a world-class event center. It's beautiful, and I've not, I've heard nothing but amazing reviews. So Thank you. Uh, that's that that's fantastic. Tell me this: What are you doing now to innovate? Like I think I think you it comes to you because you're reading, because you're actively learning. But what are some of the things you're doing now to to innovate, to be creative, to stay creative? Well, I'm I'm, I'm coming up with other things that no one else has done. Um, I, I don't like copying things. I mean, there'll be an element here or there. Oh, that's a great beer. Uh, or, that, that, you know, uh, those are great drapes. It's a good color. Uh, I like the way it flows to the left or to the right. We take ideas all the time. Um, but if you, you're not looking at new stuff and if you're not studying what other people are doing, then, then you're doing a disservice to the creative process. So I'm constantly on the move, constantly looking at new things, constantly researching uh, uh, on the internet for, for new products and ordering them and playing with them to see if operationally they'll work. You know, uh, it, it's one thing to be creative uh, and build and think about things that could be really cool. It's another thing to make sure that your operations team can make it work. What are you doing to lead yourself? You know, we talk about the trusted leader show. You have, you're incredibly creative. You're doing some things. Uh, you know, we've, at least what I've found is people that are leading others, leading these massive global initiatives that you're leading. And I haven't even talked about all of them. Um, what are you doing to lead yourself? Is there a rhythm or routine you have? You get up in the morning or you do what certain things do you do that just help you be better as a healthy person? The more mountain bike riding I do, the, the more physical exercise that, 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 that I get, the more healthy my brain and my body is and the more creative I become. Um, I usually leave a pad in every one of my cars um, and, and, and a pencil. Uh, I, I write things down. Things come to me in the shower. They come to me sometimes 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. I don't sleep very well. I'm in bed at 12 or 1 o'clock and I'm up at 4.30 or 5 every single day. And I know how unhealthy that is. And that's why I try to get as much physical uh, exercise as, as, as humanly possible and learn as, as much as I can. I, I love learning from other creative people and getting other people's thoughts. Um, and then one of the things I've learned is, you know, everybody has an opinion. Everybody has an opinion, just like everybody has a butt. We all sit on our butts. But what I like to say is when you have a creative idea, you got to bring it to the table and you got to share it with everyone so they hear it. But at the end of the day, you need to move as a team. You're never going to get 100% consensus on your ideas. I don't care who you are. You're never going to get consensus when you have a group of 20 people or 10 people. But at the end of the day, you have to ask for consensus and move as a team. And I think that's real important. And if you show the respect of being able to explain yourself and, and, and explain your idea and your thought process, people that might not disagree, that might disagree with you will go along with you because you've given them respect. What else do you do? I love that. You're, you know, we talk all about building trust in leaders and teams around the world uh, here at the Institute. And, but you have, you have to build trust with big investors. You have to build trust with Disney. You didn't always have a track record to go from. What are some of the things you did to, to build trust before you were trusted? Well, you know, little things like shaking somebody's hand, like, like, like uh, following up with a letter and a phone call. People still like getting things in in in, in writing. Uh, you know, we're so used to emails that people stopped writing letters. People don't use stamps anymore. Uh, they they just use email. I think it's a mistake. I think you need to use all of your resources. So uh, an email is great. 
a follow-up letter, something that's in print with your, your logo and your company on it and, and your handwritten signature is really important. Business cards. Business cards are one of the most important things today. And everyone's saying, oh, we're getting away from business cards, this, that, and the other thing. Everybody loves a business card. My business cards are die cut. So for T-Rex, for instance, I have a, a T-Rex, a dinosaur. It's die cut. Cost me a dollar a card. They're made out of plastic. They go through the washing machine. But they're the coolest looking cards in America. I've won all kinds of awards for all of my cards. I spent three months developing every card for every one of our businesses. People call me from all over the world asking me to send them a sample of my business card. My partners think I'm nuts because every single card costs a buck. So you're giving away a buck every single time. But on the marketing and the promotions guy. So they don't get rid of my business card. They don't put them in a pile with the other white, plain, square business cards. They put them on their computer. They take them home, give them to their kids. So we think out of the box and 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 we work out of the box. Well, <laughs> so many ways we could go. Oh man, I love your stuff. I love what you do. It's it's a, you're amazing, no doubt about it. What uh What's next? What's what's the big dream? What's what's your biggest hope for the future? Well, I love working with the Walt Disney World Company. Um, they provide you with with uh, tens of thousands of people in front of your door. Um, it, it's not cheap to do business down there, and and they don't just accept anybody. So, uh, it, if it was up to me, I would stay just doing Walt Disney World projects. I, I love their philosophy about keeping the place clean. I love their philosophy about how they treat people, uh, how they teach, how they educate. Um, and uh, it, it's in my blood. So uh, it, it, for our dime, we want to spend every uh, uh, possible minute of our day creating with the idea that we'd like to put it at Disney World. And if it goes somewhere else, uh, you know, that we, we believe will work, that's fine. But, you know, Di Walt Disney World is vanilla ice cream, mom and dad, baseball, hot dogs. I mean, it's America. Uh, so it, it works for us. What do you do? You got a team. I'm going to land the plane here, but you got a team. You've had to lead and motivate some teams. What, what, what tips do you have? Do you have one or two for how do you align and lead and motivate that team? Well, Gibson's is a great example. They're my partner's as well as Landry's restaurants. And a, a good example for Gibson's is, uh, uh, excuse me for that, Steve Lombardo, uh, who's the proprietor and started uh, uh, Gibson's. Uh, he had a party one day that came in. They wanted the cheesecake. Cheesecake wasn't on the menu. He went down the street while they were eating and bought cheesecake at a different restaurant, brought it back, and comped the cheesecake to them as a dessert. Those people... We'll never forget that as long as they live. They'll talk about it forever. And for what, a $10 investment? You've got people that will come back for the rest of their lives. So I learned a lot by that. You won't find a lot of restaurateurs that are going to do that. It's, it's all about service and the quality of the food. And once you cut one of those two things, you're not prime anymore. You're not on top of your game. So uh, we're very careful to uh, lead by example. And the examples that uh, people that have, have uh, helped me, uh, that, that are my partners, really made me a better person. Where can we find out more? There's lots of places to find out about you, but Steve Schussler, where, where can we find out more, connect with you? Uh, you, you, you can look my name up, uh, 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 or Google it. Uh, there's, there's thousands of articles. Uh, anybody ever wants to call me, they could reach me at my office at 763-746-3700. I give everybody time. It doesn't matter who calls me. There's entrepreneurs that call all the time. They want some advice. They want to talk. Um, I, I, I love to help because when I was looking for help and I was starving, okay, there weren't a lot of people out there. Uh, I want to be one of those people that are there. You are. You're a trusted example. I'm grateful to know you and grateful that we've gotten to be on the Harvey McKay Roundtable together and uh, other uh, events and times together. I'm grateful for the splash you've made in our home state of Minnesota and certainly our country and world. 
There's lots more we could talk about, but we're going to put it all in the show notes, trustedleadershow.com. We're going to put out where to get his book, where to find out about him. He's even given his phone number out. We're going to make some uh, encouragements for everybody to go eat when they go to Disney and everybody goes to Disney. Make sure you go to one of these great places, Rainforest, T-Rex, Yeti and Yak. The boathouse is amazing. We love that. Uh, but it's the Trusted Leader Show. Here's your last question, my friend. Who is a leader you trust and why? Uh, I, I trust Harvey McKay. Um, I, I trust my partners because they, they have proven over and over and over again, whether it's Landry's Restaurants or it's the Gibsons Group out of Chicago, uh, that they can be trusted, uh, that they have high morals. Um, they believe in helping other people. I believe in being charitable. Um, I didn't even get a chance to tell you about our charitable organization. Uh, tell, which, jump in right here before we close. Tell us about it. Well, it's a 501c3. Uh, it, it's called Superheroes with Super Kids Foundation. And we take children that have catastrophic illness and we bring them and their families uh, after being vetted uh, to a place that we built. It's a superhero command center. And People think they're coming to look at a new concept that I've created for Disney that the public has not seen yet. And we take the young uh, gentleman or, or young lady who has this, this, this terrible uh, disease or sickness, and we give their family a tour of this beautiful place. And, and uh, it's called Gizmos, Gadgets, and Gears, GGG. And everything moves. It's all built about kinetic energy. And uh, after we give them a tour, we feed them. And all of a sudden, in the middle of eating, Batman comes in through the front door in a $15,000 beyond belief Batman outfit. And who plays Batman? Uh, but John Polad with the Polad family, who owns the Minnesota Twins. And he comes in yelling and screaming, where's my superhero kid? And the kid raises his hand and the, and the family's there and they're all excited. And he walks over to the kid, introduces himself, and he says, please give me a tour of what you just saw. And the kid takes him by the hand and walks him around the entire place. And they, they get to a statue, um, a, 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 a bust. And uh, Batman says, why don't you take the head of the bust and, and pull it back? And he does that. He says, you see that button? Press that button. And a picture that's on the wall goes up in the air. It's lit. And while it's lit, it goes up in the air. And this brick wall opens up. And you're into the Superhero Command Center, which is absolutely on. We spent over a million dollars. We got 17 different life-size superheroes made out of fiberglass. We got a huge mural of, of Gotham City. We have a Batmobile that I spent $250,000 for. Batman brings him into a dressing room, asks him if he wants to get into an outfit. He gets into a, a Robin outfit. That man puts him inside the car, presses a button, a huge garage door opens that has a mural of a tunnel. And outside that garage door is the St. Louis Park Police Department, the St. Louis Park Fire Department with trucks and manpower. And they escort the Batmobile with Batman and, and, and our superhero kid to another place where they have dessert. And they're on the road, the sirens are going, and everything's going, and the kid is waving like he's in a parade. And then they get back after after having dessert, and we bring them back to the Superhero Command Center, and we give them a bag with a book, pictures, uh, all kinds of gifts, so that while he's either in hospice or he's home uh, trying to recuperate. And we also give him a $2,200 uh, scholarship from Wishes and More, which is the, are the people that we use that uh, uh, do the vetting. And they can use that if they make it to college for their college education. And if by some chance they don't make it, uh, the money goes to the family. So it's one of the coolest things I've ever done in my life. We, we, we like to do at least two a month. Uh, they're incredible. Uh, and uh, it's heartwarming. Super heartwarming. We're going to put that in the show notes, trustedleadershow.com. You're going to be able to find out about the donation. Maybe you want to give to it, but we certainly want to support it. And uh, Steve, this has been fantastic. You're fantastic. I'm so grateful for you and grateful for the time together. Grateful for that you share with our audience. Grateful that you're my friend. For now, this has been the Trusted Leader Show. Until next time, stay trusted. <laughs>